These are the Queen Charlotte Islands, a rugged land of wild beauty, a demanding land, isolated by treacherous waters. Here, according to the oral tradition, Raven discovered the first men. They were the Haida. Here, the Haida lived for thousands of years, adapting to the land and the sea, becoming great seamen and traders, developing a highly artistic culture which produced great works of art that ranked with those of the greatest artistic cultures of the ages. So they were numerous, the people were numerous, and they said the old chief Kung Kuyang used to sit on a rock and he'd look across to the Alaska side, he'd see the White Mountains, and he'd say, someday we have to go over there. We're getting too numerous here. There's too many of us all trying to go for the same resource. I, the chief of this group, Kung Kuyan, will take my group and we'll migrate to Alaska. We'll go across. They migrated across. And, uh, the closest place from Langara Island was, uh, was uh, Kaikani or Kigani village on the southern tip of uh, Dahl Island. That's on the west coast of Prince of Wales there. And uh, that is the place where they went across to. And after they got there, then they spread out from there. Kaigani is in Tlingit land. As the Haida moved into Tlingit land, there was several battles. The problem was solved according to traditional native law. When a great feast was held and the Clinkets gave the Haida all the land south of the middle of Kluwak Creek. Since that time, the Clinkets and Haidas have lived in peace on Prince of Wales Island. The principal Haida settlements were Haokan, Klingwan, Kasan, and Sakwan. Kaigani was a booming town then, but was later abandoned. In 1775, the Haidas became players in the competition of the European powers. King Philip II of Spain sent sailors and priests to explore. He ordered his commanders to claim land north of 54 degrees latitude. They were to report all contacts with natives, to trade wherever possible, and to teach of Christ. But the Spaniards came up through the west coast there, Quadra was head of a little frigate there. He sailed up through there in 1775. And he came into Trocadero Bay on the west coast of Prince Wales Island, and that's right where Craig is. And he surveyed the, the bay area there, and he went into Port Santa Cruz and anchored. Some of his crew was sick. And uh, they sent a party ashore, and they planted the cross there. And uh, they took possession of the land. But he saw no natives. The Hyder discovered the cross the following spring. On his second trip, Quadra did encounter the Haida. And when they came in, they fired their cannon, and the men, men folks all spread out on the beach there to welcome them. And so the Spaniards came in that way, and they started to trade with them. Both sides were skilled traders. But trade with the whites was very different than anything the Haida had known before. Haida culture was to be changed forever in both good and bad ways. However, at this point, trading was simple. The Europeans wanted furs, and the Haida wanted metal for tools. The Haidas were also very interested in the ships of the visitors. They were particularly interested in the rigging, especially the block and tackle, which became a theme in Argelite art. It was the block and tackle that helped an American captain named Roberts secure trade with the Kaigani Haida. But Captain Roberts on the ship Jefferson was there at the time, and uh, he in turn, uh, to get in good with the, uh, the fur trade, you know, and the, and the community, he wanted to do something for them, so they told him they were going to raise his totem pole. And they need help with the sailors, help them with their, with their modern blocks and tackles. That is for Chief Kunia. But he got in good with them. And so when they got the furs, you know, he got the furs, you see. The Americans, or Bostoners as they were called, prized Haida canoes and crews because of their great seamanship. 
American ships would pick up Haida crews and as many as 40 canoes. Then they hunted for fur seal as far north as the Aleutians. After the season was over, they would continue westward to the Orient, sell the furs, winter in Hawaii, and return the Haida crews to Kaigani the following spring. Trade with the whites increased the wealth of the clans. Metal tools gained in trade made it possible for the craftsmen to carve more elaborate poles in less time. In traditional Haida society, the head of a clan would give a great ceremonial feast called a potlatch for important occasions in the life of a clan. Great totem poles were carved for the occasion. So that in old days, the whole clan effort went towards the chief's doings, what he was going to do. And all the things that came in went into the coffer up to the day when he would be giving this potlatch, you see. And the potlatch was no small thing. They got ready for two, three years ahead of time. This was the cornerstone of the Haida's very sophisticated economic system that worked very much like modern banking and investment. When a clan had accumulated enough surplus wealth, they gave it away at a potlatch. And he's gathering in, all his clan is helping him because they know he ordered a totem, that he's going to have a totem pole raising or a house dedication, and he in turn would gain prestige in this potlatch. If they raise their chief stature in height of society, they in turn would be raised in stature. And so he had nothing to lose. What he gave in kind, he got back in kind, and even more so. And that was the, uh, the big thing about potlatches. Thus, the potlatch system also created a system of debts and interdependence between clans. The greater wealth of the clans and increased potlatching brought on a flurry of community house building and pole raising. This was the golden age of Haida art. Other arts also prospered. I'm firmly of the belief that uh, Charles Edenshaw invented the uh, Northwest Coast bracelet from which all the jewelry of the Northwest Coast has, has derived. And uh, it's quite an amazing accomplishment because uh, he obviously must have seen some European style engraving somewhere or another but he never saw anybody doing it. So he uh, adapted the tools which he had and uh, by an entirely different process arrived at the same uh, effect. Yeah. But also with the whites came diseases for which the Haida had no immunity. The worst was smallpox which became epidemic in the 1840s. It didn't happen once, it happened two times, two, three times, that an epidemic once amongst them and killed off a lot of people. So that in the end results, the Haida had dwindled in size, the population, from what they used to be. Thousands and thousands of them succumbed to this epidemic. The social order was disrupted as clan heads died and the shamans, the traditional healers and religious leaders were helpless to stop the deaths. This change was reflected in the art as even the figures of the shaman became a subject for the carvers. Carving a shaman figure was unheard of even just a few years before. A lesser people would have been shattered. The, the old Hattas had amazing adaptability. Uh, my grandfather, for instance, and many men of his generation, uh, emerged from the Holocaust of the uh, smallpox epidemics and the complete destruction of their society, and got to work building them new lives for themselves. Over the past 100 years, trade goods had become a big part of the Haida lifestyle. When salteries and canneries were established on Prince of Wales Island, Young Haiders worked in them, to earn wages to buy goods. This was the first time the Haiders had participated in the wage economy. In 1880, the missionaries arrived. The noted minister, Sheldon Jackson, established his first Alaska training school and mission at Haukan. Many Haida young people started attending school. 
By 1882, the Reverend J. Loomis Gould, minister of the Haukan Mission, reported that there were several Christian marriages and that Boston-style houses were popular. Haukan was a nice little town, only we lacked the water. And they had a church there, and the missionaries put a home there for the, for the children to go to school. Many chiefs converted to Christianity and became both clan and church leaders. Cut out the potlatch work because they, were, they claimed that the, they were wasting too much money. The Haida art of the totem pole was discouraged and the chiefs were asked to do away with the poles. The ministers were saying they were, Haida's were serving the totem poles. That's how they started cutting down the totem poles because they couldn't stand to hear that. The Haida's wanted to become modern. By the beginning of the 20th century, the issues which would be the great struggles of the Haida people emerged. Most important was the land issue. When Quadra arrived in 1775, he claimed the land for Spain. Then the Russians claimed it and later sold it to the Americans. All this was done with total disregard for the laws of the Haidas and the other tribes of the coast. The Haida were being squeezed out of the economy of their own land. The canneries were destroying traditional fish streams by the use of fish traps at the mouth of the stream. The establishment of the Tongass National Forest withdrew all lands in southeast Alaska with no recognition for Indian title. Even in the search for gold, the Haidas were at a disadvantage. For if they found gold, they could not file a claim because they were not considered citizens. By this time, many young Haidas had become educated in the Western way. They adopted Christian beliefs and Christian lifestyles. With encouragement of the missionaries, the Haidas looked towards gaining American citizenship, gaining control of their land, and establishing an economic base. After a fire at Haukan, the training school was moved first to Wrangell and finally to Sitka, and only a day school remained. The Haida were unhappy with the schooling available at Haukan and were unwilling to send their children to Sitka for the school year. They requested a good school for their children. The U.S. government said the villages were too small, but they could have a school if they consolidated their villages into one. To give them a better education was the grounds for that mm -hmm. moving together. So that was one of the reasons is to have, give them medical service besides the education part. Some of the elders had other reasons for wanting to move. It's pretty hard for, uh, for people to get the water in Haukan. They, they, they have to wait for low water to get, get the water from the spring. That's below the uh, high water mark. So the old people got together and they had a meeting. I don't know where it was, either Haukan or Tlingkwan. They got together and start talking about where they want to move. And they talked it over for, for several days, maybe a week. So they picked this place here. And then they, they all voted to, to uh, come over here in this place called Heidelberg now. You ask any old timers in Heidelberg, they'll tell you the same story that they had a hard time to build this town when they first started. That is 1911 and 12. But when they first came from uh, Hokan and Klinkwan, they, they came to Heidelberg here. And then they, uh, they used to live in tents when they first moved over here. That is, uh, on Thanksgiving, they had big storm. Yes, I remember where the, the people at Heidelberg would help each other when they first came here. There was a, they built a sawmill first, that everybody would go down and work, and they'd build each other's home. A lot of homes were built, and then community buildings were built, schoolhouses, a church, and nobody got paid for it, but they all worked together. At
people never worked for wages. They all uh, helped each other. That was really one of the best things that ever happened. But after that uh, Thanksgiving, uh, Heidelberg's birthday, well, they didn't talk about the hardship anymore. They wanted to go on ahead for education purpose so that the young people would become educated so they could help their own people. Yeah.